Good morning, everyone. That's quite the uh, intro. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Todd. I'm the Connections Pastor uh, here at Pathway Church. I'm a little bit blown away right now, actually, because Jason and I had very, very limited conversations about what songs we were going to be doing this morning. Um, that was just, it was pretty cool, as you'll see throughout my message. So much of what we just sang about is what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Um, so you may know that we are continuing uh, this week in a series that Pastor Nathan has started called The Names of God. And I'm going to just jump right over to a definition that we have here. I'm going on name. So a name is a word or words that a particular person, animal, place, or thing is known by. We kind of already knew that, but there it is. That's what a name is. And, and I'd love that in week one, Nate, you, you let us know that your name means a gift of God, which is true and is very accurate. That's what Jess told me. Very accurate. It's really good. A gift of God. Carolyn, who is my wife, her name means joy, and she's always telling me how she's always bringing joy into my life, and she's always accurate, 100%. My name, name, my name means fox. <laughs> it's like gift of God, joy, fox. And I remember looking at baby books and stuff like that when we were looking for our kids' names, and you know, you want to look at your own, right? And I saw fox, and I'm like, really? And, and some people try and like, you know, make it something that it's not, and they're saying, oh, it actually means clever, and wily, intelligent, something like that. No, it just, it just means fox. Um, I wanted to throw something kind of creative out there, uh, but honestly, I don't even know what a fox would say. So I, <laughs> there's not much I could do there. Oh, I have four kids. I can tell all the dad jokes I want. Um, you know what? My name doesn't have a very significant meaning. But the whole point of this series is that God's name has significant meaning. His names and his titles. Uh, we've talked about a few of them throughout this series, which we'll have right here. Coming up. There it is. Three primary names for God. Just so you guys know, actually, I say that, and I feel bad even saying that. The guys that work back there, they're incredible. It actually blows my mind how on the ball they are. <laughs> So I appreciate it, Henry. That's so good. So we talked about three. Uh, there's lots of names for God in Scripture. These are three that we'll see a lot. Elohim, seen over uh, 2,500 times. Adonai, that uh, means master. Yahweh, Jehovah is one that I'm not going to talk a lot about. If you go back to week one of the series, uh, Nathan does a really great job talking about what that all means. But this is the personal name of God. And we're, what we're doing throughout this series is we're talking about different aspects of that. Now, last week, actually, before I get to last week, I wanted to go to a scripture, Psalm 34. So Psalm 34, 3, which has been kind of a key verse that we're going over throughout the series. It says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together, Psalm 34, 3. So that's, that's what we're trying to do throughout this series. Uh, I forgot the magnifying glass, right? Like I couldn't do the, the fun thing that Nate got to do with that. It's on my desk in my office. But we all know what a magnifying glass does. It actually makes things bigger so we can see it in more detail. I know when I was in college, I got a rude awakening the first week because when I was sitting at the back of the lecture hall, I realized I could not see anything. I could see nothing. It was literally a blur. And uh, so I had to go and get glasses, and all of a sudden it was sharpened. I could see the information that would help me learn. But I think a magnifying glass doesn't just magnify things so we can see them clearly. I think it magnifies power as well. And I, I'm sure I'm not alone. I, as a kid, I did not use a magnifying glass to make things bigger. Um, I used it to start fire, right, with paper, dry leaves, maybe an ant or two got in the way, but it, like I would use my magnifying glass in the sun for that, and that was a lot of fun, but when we do this, we can magnify our understanding, but it also magnifies the power of what we're trying to learn. Now, last week, uh, Nathan was talking about Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, and he used this wheel as an analogy that I thought was really, really good because he talks about how God provided the sacrifice that we needed, that needed to be paid for. He provided it in Jesus. And he talks about how in the story of Abraham and Isaac, God needed to make sure that Abraham had God right here, right in the middle. If God wasn't right in the middle, if he was just off to the side somewhere, this whole thing would collapse. It wouldn't work right and you'd crash. So it's so important that we have 
God in the middle. And we're going to see that throughout this message um, this morning as well. That it's so important that for all of us, we put God in the middle of the wheel, in the middle of our lives. And in fact, a lot of what Nathan was talking about was talking about sacrifice. Now, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac and how uh, Jesus was sacrificed for each and every one of us. And it's really interesting because this morning I'm going to be talking and reading through Psalm 23. One chapter back in Psalm 22, you'll actually see a lot of descriptions about what Jesus endured. In fact, Jesus actually quoted part of Psalm 22, which is really, really interesting. But this week, we are going to be talking about Jehovah Rohi. So Jehovah Rohi, it means shepherd. It's one that leads to pasture, one that feeds, one that protects. And I, again, I love the songs that were played because throughout the Old Testament and so many songs that we sing, we, we read and we sing about an awesome God, and that's true. We see a creator. We see a magnificent God. We see an all-powerful God. And God is absolutely 100% all of those things. Unfortunately, I think many of us keep him there. We keep him at awesome and powerful, but he never gets close. He never gets close to us. I think for some of us, maybe at some time in our life and maybe right now, we believe that God is powerful and he is amazing in every way, but we maybe haven't let him get close and personal with us. He, he feels distant, detached, impersonal, and, and we wouldn't admit it to someone else, but maybe we feel that a little bit. So we're going to be going through Psalm 23 this morning, as I mentioned, and this is an account of David, and David throughout Scripture talks about how incredible God is, and he magnifies his name and all of that stuff, but in Psalm 23, he also gets very personal. Now, one of the issues, and one of the reasons I have a stuffed animal up here, which you might be wondering, um, a large challenge with portions of Scripture like Psalm 23 is whether you've been in church your whole life or you haven't been in church very much, um, Psalm 23 is something you've heard a lot. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but with me, sometimes when you hear something a lot, it loses a bit of its power. And it can become actually a little bit more about something like this. It can become all about sheep, and sheep are cute, and and, uh, Carolyn's going to be mad at me. She told me to wash this before I used it. It's kind of dirty, but anyways, we got a sheep, and this was one of our kids, and if you squeezed it, it was actually this really cute kid that would recite Psalm 23, and every like Bible bookstore and Christian bookstore around like has stuff like this, right? See, the problem is we've taken Psalm 23 And we put it on posters, we put it on signs, we put it on Pinterest, we've made quilts out of it, quilts for beds, quilts for walls, quilts for floors. I don't know why quilts go all these different places, but we've done that to this incredible portion of scripture. And and it's good, we've done that because it's really important, but I, I feel like it loses a bit of its power. So hopefully this morning we'll be able to magnify that a little bit and get some of that power back. The other thing before we jump in is just to remember who the author of this is. It's David. And David, he, he was a very successful man to say the least. But before David met Goliath and killed the giant, before he became king, before he conquered different areas, before he became very wealthy, before all of that stuff, David was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. So he understood sheep and he understood what it was like to be a good shepherd. So with that I want to jump right in to Psalm 23. We're going to start with verse 1, and not even the full thing, just the start. The Lord is my shepherd. We have all heard this so many times. The Lord is my shepherd. Do you notice David didn't say the Lord is a shepherd? He didn't say the Lord is the shepherd. He said the Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. And there's power in making something personal. I know, I have four kids that play hockey. I have been at hockey tournaments the last two weekends. Everyone's trying to squeeze it in just in case something gets shut down or something. But I have had the opportunity to watch hockey parents a lot over the last few days. And if there is one group of people that start taking things very personal, it's hockey parents. Like if someone's skating down the ice 
and it's just a kid, and they get slashed or illegally hit or something, it's like people barely notice. They might be like, oh, that wasn't very nice. If it's the kid, like the star kid on your team, they'll start getting riled up, right? They'll be like, you can't do that. They might even sort of say something directed toward the ref. Oh, but when it's my child, when it's my kid, I have seen some awesome things over the years. I have seen people that you interact with probably all the time, and and they have very respectable jobs. They're so, honestly, kind people, really nice people, just like you, really, really nice people. I, I, I'm thinking of faces as I say this, so I try not to say too much. But I remember this one lady, and she's so sweet. But it's like the face gets red. She starts, like, you know, unbuttoning the sleeves. And she's, like, just screaming. And, and the language, it's, like, incredible because it's my kid. It was her kid. I remember watching a dad at Kinsman Arena two years ago climb the glass. He is up there hanging on the glass by his armpit, screaming at an 18-year-old referee because he didn't like the call. It gets really personal when it's my. Imagine if as we walk through Psalm 23 this morning, we actually look at this really personally. What if we had the passion of a hockey parent this morning? Because there is power when it gets personal. We're going to look at the second half of this. Now, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, when David wrote this Psalm 23, this was like later on in his life. So this isn't while he was in a field somewhere. And at this point in his life, when you look at things and possessions and finances, yes, he he didn't want, but that's not what this is. That's not what this is about at all. See, David throughout his life, he had all kinds of ups and downs. He has some crazy stories and we know about them because they're recorded in scripture. We have all of these um, things that David has gone through, and he says, I shall not want. He's not talking about things here. He's not talking about possessions. He's not talking about money. See, he's talking about Jehovah Rohi. He is talking about in God, in my shepherd, he has everything that he needs. He doesn't want for anything. And I think right there in the first verse, we miss that so often. And and honestly, that's going to be an anchor for this entire morning. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Not because I'm going to pray for a new car and God's going to be like, bam, new car. It's not like that. God's not a genie. It's about having him. It's about having him. Let's go to verse two. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, there might be some golfers here that hear that, and that actually terrifies you, because you think of green pastures and still waters, and you're just like, this is trouble, actually. This is trouble. But no, that's not what this means. That's not what it means at all. This is different. See, in those days, shepherds would often bring their sheep in the heat of the day, and they would find a green pasture, still waters, somewhere where they could drink, and they would actually make them rest, stay in a certain area, maybe even lie down. Because those shepherds knew that for the betterment of the sheep, they needed time to rest. Is there anything we need in our life more than that right now? Again, we just read these scriptures because we, we've read them a hundred times before. But I think about the, the physical, the mental, the emotional rest that is needed uh, for us right now. I know there's, there's so many people in this place right now that are extremely tired, Uh, been through a lot, very discouraged, and and most of you are probably, actually you don't even have to smile back at me because most of us are wearing masks, but it's for all of us, myself included, we're going through so many different things in life, but David found, David found when he allowed God to lead him, that God would bring him to green pastures. He would bring him to still waters. He would bring him to a place of rest. And I think that's something that we could all uh, use in our lives for sure. So let's go to verse three. He says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now this is um, a bit of foreshadowing of Jesus' work on the cross, but David kind of got a hold of this before. As Again, I mentioned in Psalm 22, we were talking about that. See, this isn't that David kind of figured out the key to good morality. 
It's not that David figured out, oh, this is how I can be good enough. It's, it's not about that. It's actually about being led to that place. It's actually about what God has done for us. It has nothing to do with our goodness or about David's goodness. This is about his goodness. Which brings us to verse 4, which is another one of those verses that you might see on a lot of quilts and a lot of posters and a lot of those things. We'll start at the beginning. Even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, has anyone ever felt like you were in that place? The valley of the shadow of death. Like David literally faced death multiple times. But it's not just that. You think of a valley with, with shadows and, and it's like there's death looming all around you. It's, it's that whole idea of loneliness, of fear, of uncertainty and all of those things. And David certainly felt those things. If you go through the book of Psalms, you'll see it. He, he's like, God, I magnify your name. You're amazing. The next chapter, he's like, oh God, where are you? I don't know what's going on. And I think we can all identify with that. But I think the second half of this verse Add so much power to it. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Oh man, that's so key. We're all going to walk through valleys. We're going to walk through dark times. But this is the promise that David is trying to share with people, that he will be with me, with his rod and staff to guide me, to protect me. I actually read, there was one, um, I was reading a few commentaries preparing for this, and there was one guy who was talking about Jehovah Rohi, and he actually used um, this translation, he who is here is my shepherd. He who is here is my shepherd. Not, not saying that bad things won't happen, but when they do happen, God, your shepherd will be there right beside you. It won't be happening alone. We'll go to verse 5 now. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Now this feels like a bit of a change of direction, but it's actually not. He's still talking about the same thing. He's still talking about getting very personal with God. He's talking about intimacy with God. I talked earlier about uh, hockey parents. There's a, I know a lot of hockey parents. I could leave this place after the service, drive to any arena in the city, and I know I will run into people I know. I I just will. I've got to know a lot of people. Do you know a lot of them? We're not really close friends. Like we're acquaintances. I'll I'll talk to them. I kind of know what they do for a living and that's fine. See, there's other people that I've gotten to know better and maybe we've golfed together or, or watched the Leafs lose a playoff series together or something like that. Like you get a little bit closer, but there are a handful of those people we've actually gotten really close with. There's a handful of those people we have invited them to our house and shared a meal with them. And I think that's what this is talking about in verse 5. This is a really personal thing. You prepare a table before me in the uh, the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. We we don't talk about anointing head with oil right now, but there, like this is a celebration. This is a sign of abundance. When when I read this verse, I actually think of, and I think Nathan might have mentioned it last week or the week before, um, but Luke 15 with the prodigal son. And, And he takes his inheritance and he goes and he blows it and he messes up and he comes back. And the father, instead of just scolding him and getting mad at him, he welcomes him back. He gives him a coat and his ring and he throws him a huge party. That's the, that's the idea of celebration here. It is the absolute overwhelming love of God being poured out on us. And not just half filled. It says it's overflowing. And that is the picture of what God wants with us. And this is for me. This is not for like a person. It's not for the person. This is what God wants for me. He makes it very personal, which brings us to the last verse of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will, or I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So he says, in conclusion, when we look at all of these things, God's grand plan for your life is that he would be your shepherd, and that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. See, when we go back to, uh, in verse 3, when he says, he restores my soul, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. That's pointing towards what Jesus did on the cross. That's where this goodness and this mercy, it's following me all the days of my life. And then I love that this goes so well with what we were singing about at the end of this. David, if you read through Psalms and read about his life, 
He was constantly trying to get in the presence of God. He wanted to be close. He wanted to be close to God. And and right here, he wants to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So from verse 1 to 6 in Psalm 23, um, in the midst of knowing, because David knew, David knew that God was majestic. He knew that he was powerful. He had seen it in his life. He knew that God could do incredible things. He knew that God created everything and everyone. But David also knew a very personal provider, protector, and guide that want to be in relationship with him. But here's the thing. God gives us a choice. He gives us a choice. Are we going to allow him? Are we going to make him? Remember the wheel? Are we going to make God the center? Are we going to make him right in the middle? Are we going to allow him to lead us? Allow him to guide us? We have that choice. He's calling. It's up to us if we're going to follow or not. Now, this isn't the first time in Psalm 23 that we talk about Jehovah Rohi uh, in Scripture. In Genesis 48, um, Jacob, so that's Abraham who Nathan talked about last week. It's his grandson, also named uh, Israel. And he actually referred to God by the same name. And he'd messed up in his life just like all of us do, but he knew him as my shepherd, not as shepherd, not the shepherd. He knew him as my shepherd. So that was almost a thousand years before David wrote Psalm 23. So a thousand years before, and then now 500 years after Psalm 23, we we see Ezekiel, who's a prophet. So a prophet, one that proclaims the word of God. And oftentimes they would foretell the future and and future events. And in in, uh, Ezekiel 34, he foretells someone coming in the lineage of David. He's going to be coming. And what is he coming to be? Jehovah Rohi, the shepherd for his people. And we fast forward five or 600 years. And that brings us to Jesus. Brings us to John 10, which we're going to pick up right now. So John 10, uh, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Again, that's what uh, Nathan spoke about last week, how Jesus came and laid down his life for his sheep. This is very much um, overlapping with Psalm 23, verse 3. This was not free, but it was paid for by someone else. Is this absolutely an extravagant love that Jesus talks about? Absolutely. Think to yourself, how many people would you lay down your life for? Is it 20? Is it two? Is it zero? I don't know. We will probably all have different answers to that one. But Jesus, the almighty God, was willing to lay down his life for us. It's incredible. It was verse 12. He was the hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Again, this is talking, it's not personal with that person. It's not personal with someone who's just hired. See, there's a different relationship that Jesus has than someone who's just a hired hand. And then in verse 14, it says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Again, very personal. Very personal. Let's read the last couple of verses here. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. And this last verse is actually quite important for us because we got to remember Jesus here was talking to a bunch of Jewish people that were around him. What Jesus is saying in this last one, he's including the Gentiles. He's including um, many of us who are in this place. Here's the thing. Jesus wasn't what everyone expected, but he was exactly what we needed. He was exactly what we needed. See, in those times when, and we talk about this often at Christmas, which is coming up uh, very soon, but the people in Israel were expecting this conquering hero. They were expecting this warrior. They were expecting the Jewish version of William Wallace to come down. That's what they were expecting. That's not what came. They actually needed something more. They needed someone to lead them, to guide them, to protect them. And that was done when he laid his life down. And this is the thing I love about Jesus. He, he got down in the dirty areas that no one else wanted to go to, right? 
He, he would talk to sinners. He would talk to lepers. He would talk to big crowds, small crowds, or just one person. He took time for one person. The sad part is sometimes we won't take time for one person, but he took time for one person. He made it very personal. Jesus, the Son of God. And he was there when creation happened. And Jesus decides to get really personal with those in the Bible, and he wants to be really personal with you. A really awesome quote here, and I'm going to wrap things up by Charles Spurgeon. He's a preacher from the 1800s. He says this. This blows me away. Give me $10 million, and one reversal of fortune may scatter it. Give me a spiritual hold on the divine assurance that the Lord is my shepherd, my shepherd. I shall not want, and I am set for life. I cannot go broke with this stock in my hand. I can never be bankrupt with this security. Is that what you think of when you uh, see this verse plastered in different places? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Is this that divine assurance that you're like, I am set for life. I love that language, set for life. Usually when I hear set for life, it's right after someone buys a lottery ticket, right? You go into a convenience store, I'm like, I'm set for life, I'm going to win. Uh, no, you're probably not. You're probably not going to win. But I think we have to ask ourselves, and we can only ask ourselves, and we can only be as honest as we're going to be. Do we have that divine assurance? See, and it's not just for David, and it's not just for people in the Bible. It's for us too. I can remember a conversation uh, not too long ago that happened just right about there, right about there in the gym. And um, and it, it was a conversation that Carol and I were having. Um, <laughs> didn't anticipate this. Uh, Kirk and Linda Goodman. And uh, <laughs> Linda had been through some valleys. As many of you know, some of you may not know, uh, Linda Goodman passed away. She's with Jesus right now. But she went through some battles for years and years and years. She went through some battles. And we were chatting, and uh, they told us that her cancer was back. And, uh, of course, it's like you don't know what to say, right? You're, you're just sitting there. And someone says that, and you don't know what to say. And I'll never forget, she looked me in the eyes, and it's one of those moments that is just so real. And she's like, Todd, I trust him. I was like, wow. I trust him. See, this, this divine assurance, this is not just about David, just about a story, and it's a good story. Like, it's not about that. Like, we can have this too. I'll never forget that. She had that divine assurance. She trusted him. Whichever ways things went, and it wasn't like, I trust him if he heals me, or I trust him if this gets better. He's just, she was just like, I trust him. So I think as we finish up this morning, I guess my challenge for you, and challenge for me, I've been challenging myself in this all week. Are we going to keep God distant and impersonal? Say all the right things. He's great. He's our creator. I believe he is the all-powerful God, but never... Let him get close. See, in order for him to get close, <laughs> we have to make God the center. I love this analogy. It made so much sense. We have to make him the center. If, if we're going to allow him to lead us, if we're going to allow him to guide us, we've got to let him get close. So we ask ourselves, do I have this assurance that Charles Spurgeon speaks of? Do I have this assurance? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, Period. Do we have that assurance? And if yes, that's amazing. And, and I hope you continue um, and, and, and find that rest and find that direction and protection and all those things. But I have a hunch there's some of us that maybe don't have that assurance. There, there's probably some of us, whether we're here or watching online, uh, we don't have that insurance. And I want to, assurance. And I want to encourage you that it's right there. It's right there for you. You know, for some of us, he might be a shepherd. He might be the shepherd that someone I know knows, but he's not my shepherd. And I want to encourage you this morning um, that you have an opportunity, you have an invitation 
to make him your shepherd. And maybe you have a long time ago, but maybe this is an opportunity to do it afresh. Because God will always be great. He will always be mighty. But we can keep him at arm's distance if we like. You know, Nathan talked about uh, putting our trust in him and about salvation. And I think we need to make him our shepherd for that to be the case. And life won't be perfect once we make that decision. We put him in charge. We say, yes, I will follow you. Yes, I'm putting you at the center of my wheel. It's not like life's going to be perfect. There's still going to be valleys and there's going to be shadows. And eventually there's going to be death on this earth. But you'll never, ever do it alone again. You'll never do it alone again. And I guess this morning, we're going to be singing a song in just a second. Um, but I just want to let you know, at the very end of Psalm 23, it said David desired to go to the house of the Lord. He wanted to go to the presence of God. He wanted to go where God is. And I just wanted to let you know that God is here, right? If you're watching online, if you're in your living room, or if you're watching this five weeks from now while you're riding a bus somewhere on your phone, I, I don't know. But God's presence is here. He's here. And, and sometimes we might think, oh, no, that's, that's just for like the Bible people or that's just for like Pastor Nathan. He can go to the presence of God, but I can't. But actually this, this whole morning is about creating a place where we can be in God's presence. And sometimes we sing in his presence. Sometimes we pray. Sometimes we just sit and listen. But we're there right now. And we can decide, God, do I want you to be this great and mighty, but far off God, or am I asking you to be Jehovah Rohi this morning, to be close, to be closer to close, to be my shepherd? Can I pray? God, thank you. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for Psalm 23. Thank you for David, who went through all that he went through, and this is where he landed, God, that the Lord is my shepherd, that I shall not want God. And there have been times in my life where I feel like I've really understood this. And there's been other times, God, where I've not felt like this, God. And I trust the other people that are here, the other people that are watching this right now have felt the same, God. God, we just say anew, lead me, guide me, be my center, God. God, I'm inviting you. I know you're right here now. You want to get close right now, God. And Father, I just thank you that you are faithful. You are consistent and you are true. And we know that as we call out to you and say, God, we don't want you to be distant anymore. We know that you are right there. You are right there, God. Thank you for your goodness, God. In Jesus' name, amen.